So as many of you guys know, I have three kids and my kids are so involved in school, in sports, and like extracurricular activities. And so during the school year, like fall, winter, and spring, and a little bit of summer, we're so busy with schedules, with practices, with games, with dances, with events, birthday parties. It just keeps going on and on and on. And uh, so like Monday and Wednesday, it's just kind of a typical kind of week for us. It's like a Monday and a Wednesday. We have our older two kids, which are in high school. Uh, they have practices, which is usually like three to six o'clock or so, which isn't too tough or big deal. But Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays is so hard because we have practices with all three kids at different times, different locations, or there's different games that they're a part of. So my wife and I, we kind of play this zone defense. Who's picking up who? Who's dropping off who? Who's able to help us or not help us? What can we do to help somebody out? It just turns into this whole madness. And especially when you throw in games and practices and different time practices into the mix. And on Saturday, finally Saturday, in the morning time, we all go to my youngest son's games, all of us. And it's almost like this deep sigh of we made it to the end of the week, knowing that in a day or so, there's another full week ahead of sports, schedules, practices, FFA, all that kind of stuff. And so we are so dedicated and even like purposeful on getting our, our kids to certain events and all that kind of stuff. And, and I know that I'm not the only one. And I did want to pause here for a quick second. I know that in my time in ministry, I was kind of at the tail end of the old guard. And now I'm kind of in this kind of new phase that in the old guard of, of church ministry, we have had a tendency as a staff, as just church in general, not just here, but all over America, where we kind of judge people's spirituality on how often they attend church which is totally unfair and not good because there's a lot of good things that come out of sports as well as like acting school, karate, all this. I mean, there's so much good that comes out of it, like hard work, work ethic, dedication to a team. It's, it's working as a team. There's so many good things that come out of it. But not only that, but we get an opportunity when we're in uh, watching our kids participate in these events is we get to rub shoulders and elbows with people that would never walk into a building. And so we have an opportunity to spread Jesus's love to people all around us. And so as a church leader, I just wanna first and say that I'm sorry that if I've ever came across that way, because that is not really the reality. But some things though, there are some times where we put so much dedication and so much purpose in something that is good but it's not a long standing kind of thing that will last throughout their whole life. And so I wanna to spend today talking about this idea of being purposeful, being purposeful. And we will see how God is purposeful throughout these next 16 verses in chapter 13 of Exodus. And so Pastor Drew, the last two weeks have been working through the plagues. And last week in chapter 12, there's the last plague of God that sends and rescues his people. But in the midst of that, there was the angel of death that came. And so God rescues his people. And now in chapter 13, he has this call to remember. But what are they to remember? They're to remember that they are God's children, that God has specifically loved them as a nation and as a people group. And so in chapter 13, we see how God is continually to remind them about what he's done, about this amazing rescue and this promise that he keeps. So jumping right into in verses one and two of chapter 13, this is how it starts off. It says, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first who opened the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast is mine. There's a word here that's not usually a word that we use in today's uh, language or vernacular. It's this word consecrate. In verse two, the Lord says, consecrate to me all the firstborn. But what does consecrate mean? Consecrate means to sacrifice or to present. It is to pull aside. 
okay? And so he's saying it belongs to God. This sacrifice belongs to him. And, um, but why the firstborn? Like, why the firstborn? And, and I know that a lot of firstborn children would love this. Firstborn was seen as the best. And we're supposed to offer our best to the Lord. So I have an older brother and I have jokingly said to him that you may be the best because you're the firstborn, but I'm the baby. So I may have been loved just a little bit more. But, but what, we're, what we see here is God saying, offer the best. And the best, especially in this culture and especially in this time, was the first. In verse three, it says, then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Um, I love food. Food is so good. But here's the thing with food. I don't know much about food. I don't know how things are made and things like that. And we see here in verse three, it says, no leavened bread shall be eaten. But it makes you wonder, what does Moses or even God have against this lumpy bread, this, this leaven, okay? And in today's world, leaven is really uh, yeast. And so what they're saying is like, no leavened bread, only unleavened bread. And it makes you wonder why. You see, there's a couple different reasons why. And one was when this last plague had happened, Pharaoh's like, you need to get out of Egypt. So they didn't have time to prep and prepare for this mass exodus that happens. In chapter 12, verse 39, it says, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. You see, this leavened bread was, it's all about, or excuse me, this unleavened bread is all about God being purposeful. Like there's a reason why he says these things. And Moses, the reason why he's communicating these things. Another reason why, like, and it's a little bit more heavier, a little bit more of the main reason why they're supposed to eat unleavened bread as opposed to leaven is because leaven represents sin, corruption, and evil. And so because this is a brand new nation, God does not want sin, does not want corruption, does not want evil, a part of his chosen people. Again, God is purposeful in the reasons why he does this. Even the things that's hard to understand, but he's purposeful. There's a reason for what's going on. And we see this in Leviticus chapter two, where like no leaven is allowed to be even sacrificed. In chapter two, verse 11, it says, no grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. Of you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as food offering to the Lord. These people, again, are a new nation and leavened bread is a reminder of what God has delivered them from. And he's saying, remember what I did. No leavened bread. In verses four through through seven, we see here, uh, moving on, it says, today in the month of Abib, Abib is in the spring months. It says, today in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing of milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Now, for seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, there shall be, no, there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. No sin, no corruption, no malice, no evil. But why? Like, why, why uh, uh, leaven the bread? Why? It's because God is purposeful in the fact that he wants to set apart this new nation from everyone else. That when people are like, why don't you do certain things they can point back to because God delivered us out of slavery that there's this real God who loves us so much that he has a plan and a purpose for our life. 
So it kind of begs the question for us who have crossed that line of faith, who said, I, I put my hope and trust in Jesus. Do you look much different than the world around you? Do you look much different than the classmates at your school that's coming up here in a few weeks? Do you look much different than the person you work next to every day? Are you set apart from everyone else? How different do you look? So moving on in verses eight through 10, this is what it says. It says, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And that shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statue at its appointed time from year to year. They are to uh, uh, talk. They are supposed to share with their kids, with their grandkids, with their family, with their community about what God has done. Um, I'm a father, as I said, of three, and I have to constantly remind my kids about what they're supposed to do or why we do certain things. But even more important than that, like some kids that were moved out of Egypt, maybe been so young, they didn't understand. And so, so Moses is letting them know to remind them of the why. It's almost like the why behind the what. And, and even years from now, when they continue to celebrate this, you see here, it says from year to year, years from now, when, when young kids weren't even around when this exodus has happened, they can share with them the why behind the what. This is why we do this thing is because God was purposeful and removed us from Egypt. Now for you, there are people who don't know or don't understand what God has done in your life. For us that have passed across that line of faith, we were headed in one direction, but by his grace and his love, he moved us away from where we're headed toward him. And there's been this change in our life or this slowly becoming more like him. And people are wondering what happened and we're supposed to share. But so we get so busy with thinking about other people that we totally forget about our family though. You know, there's this uh, living on mission statement that we've said over and over again. Living on mission is where you live, it's where you work, and it's where you play. And if you're anything like me, when we hear the where you live, we instantly think of maybe our block, our neighbors, our community, our neighborhood, and we kind of think of like that, but it's really also about who you live with. Who you, who you work with. It's not just people in general, it, it's specific people in your life. It's who you play, who you, who you do fun things with. It's not just a community. It's not just an area. It's not just a zip code, but it's even your own kids and your own grandkids. And that neighbor that maybe uh, their parents don't know the Lord, and, but those kids that need to know about God's goodness and about his love. You see, living on mission is also living uh, or being on mission with who you live with, who you work with, and who you play with. As Christians, we have been saved and rescued too. Maybe not from a literal slavery like this, like this new nation. Some of us potentially has, but for most of us, we not a literal type of slavery, but we were enslaved to sin. And, and Jesus broke us free from that. And we have a story to share about his goodness and to constantly remember him because God is purposeful over and over and over again. And he's reminding his people that he keeps his promises. In verse 11, it says, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you, you and your fathers and shall give it to you. Moses uses two future tenses here. He says, when and shall. He says, when the Lord brings you into the land. Now, um, hundreds of years before this, there was this guy named Abraham and he left all that he ever knew to follow God's call. 
And in the book of Genesis chapter 17, he arrives in this land of Canaan. And God says, this is going to be your land for you and your descendants. You're going to have descendants upon descendants, uh, more than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And these people are headed there because God keeps his promise again and again and again. Then Moses starts sharing uh, right after this in verses 12 and 13, some interesting things that we'll kind of break down here. In verse 12, it says, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with the lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. Sounds strange, doesn't it? But again, I, I've said this multiple times. God is purposeful. There's a reason why it's set up this way. You see, donkeys were considered unclean animals. I mean, we really don't sit around, they're unclean to eat. Like we don't really sit around going, man, that was a really good donkey. No, we don't do that because they're not a flocked animal. And so donkeys are unfit to eat. And what is clean are these flocked animals. So you're looking at sheep and goats and lambs. Like these are clean animals. And so we can, we can uh, eat these clean animals and then offer them as a sacrifice and have a feast for it, but you cannot do that with a donkey. And if you're unable to redeem your donkey for a sheep or for a clean animal, you're supposed to do a clean break where there's no blood that's spilled. So you see, there's a reason for this. And the reason is, is to remind them of the plague that delivered them out of Egypt that wiped out all the firstborn males and animals. It's to remind them of God's goodness. It's to consecrate, it's to set them apart, to remind them of how the Lord delivered them. It's almost as if God's saying, you're going to offer up your first and your best as a permanent reminder of what I did for you. But, but what about the sons? Like we see here, he goes on and he says, um, every force, firstborn of man among you, your sons, you shall redeem. God's not saying you need to sacrifice your sons. He's not saying that on any level. What he's saying is that the son that you have, you give five silver coins to, to uh, a, a priest and he gives you a lamb to offer it as a sacrifice. Moses then says, well, what happens when your son asks questions? What are you to do next? He says, and when it comes to, or when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. If I were to ask a question, how many of us have um, found out about Jesus from our parents? I mean, I was one of those. I didn't grow up necessarily in a Christian home, but, but my, my parents were the first one to tell me about who Jesus is. And that's the way that God has it set up. He wants families to be the ones who, who show their kids who Jesus is. And, and it's not much has changed from this time here that, that Moses is telling the, this new nation about God, saying, point your kids to Christ. And we live in this new culture now where we have this idea that we're supposed to drop our kids off to the professional Christians, to teach them, have them teach them about Jesus instead of, as a family unit, learning together, growing together, talking about the good things, talking about what God has freed them from and helped them through. It's almost like we're all about outsourcing everything. If, if I'm not good at a certain uh, sport, I'm gonna hire a coach to go do that. If I, if I don't know how to uh, be an actor or anything like that, I'm gonna outsource it. And if, I, if I'm not a professional Christian, I'm gonna outsource that to the church. 
But God wants you to be the spiritual hero for your family, not a building. He wants you to be that. He doesn't want me to be that for your child. He wants me to be that for my kids. You see, our role as a church is to help guide, is to give resources, is to counsel, is to love, is to pray for you and your family. Your role is to lead. Your role is to lead. Now, in my years of ministry, I've, I've understood that there's three roles or three parts that happen. There's God's part. God did his part. He saw that there was sin and depravity. And so he sent his son to be the sacrifice for us, that we can have a communication. We could have a way to God. So God did his part. And we, as parents, we have our part. Grandparents, we have our part where we continue to show, to guide, to love our kids and and teach them about what Jesus, what God has done. But there's also a third piece. It's their part. Now, I know that there are plenty of Christians and plenty of people that have raised their kids um, in, in, they have raised their kids to look more like Christ the best way that they can. And for whatever reason, their kids have yet to respond because it also comes down to their part. There's a God part. There's our part and it's their part. Moving on, it says that, um, and when in time your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, you shall say to him. It's almost like the kids are curious about this redemption, about we were there, now we're here and we have this unleavened bread. Like, what does this mean? There's this conversation that happens. And the reason why this conversation is happening is because this new nation is living it out. They're living out the rules and the laws of this new nation that God has from this purposeful plan he has for them. How about you? Are you living it out that would draw your kids or your grandkids to ask questions about your faith? Grandma, why why don't we watch certain movies? Um, Dad, why, why don't we say certain words? Or I heard somebody say this, like, why don't we do those things? Do your kids ask you questions to about your faith on the reasons or the why behind the what? We need to be praying for those moments and leading not just with our words, but also with our actions. Moses says this word here. He says, therefore, in in, in verse 15, he says, therefore, because of this great rescue, because of his great mercy, because of his great love and what he's done for us, because of those things, I will offer up my best firstborn animal and I will redeem my son, my oldest son, because God wants them to never forget the great rescue. In verse 16, it says, it shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes for by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Um. Back in November, I was playing basketball and um, I caught a ball wrong and I bent up my finger. This is what my finger looks like now. And I remember after it happened, obviously it hurt. And I thought, you know, I'll just ice it. And then, you know, I thought at at the time it was just kind of jammed it, but I ended up uh, dislocating my finger and I didn't do anything about it. I didn't go get it checked out, try to heal or anything like that. So every time I I talk, I talk so much with my hand, every now and then I'll see it in the peripheral of my vision. And it instantly reminds me of what had happened. And so in verse 16, Moses saying, it shall be a mark on your hand. There, there should be something to remind you about his goodness and about the rescue he has for you. And always, always remember, never forget about the rescue. Never forget about his goodness. Never forget about his love. Always, always remember. Something in these 16 verses that um, I think is so huge is over and over again in verses 
3, 9, 14, and 16, we see this by a strong hand, the Lord brought us or brought you out of slavery or out of Egypt over and over again. He keeps coming back to this because Moses didn't, it wasn't by Moses' hand. It wasn't. Moses was there to teach, to guide. He was there to do those things, but it was God's hand that saves. It was God's hand that saves. But why? I've said this I don't know, countless times, almost in my head, at least countless times. Why? Because God is purposeful. There's a reason. There's a reason why he does certain things. He is a purposeful God. He's dedicated. He, he's tenacious. He's unshakable for his love for his kids, that he'll do whatever it takes. He's tenacious for you. For you and your kids, are you tenacious? Are you unshakable? Are, are you at that place that you're committed no matter what? I'm, I'm gonna be just as dedicated to teaching my kids about the Lord as I am to making sure that they get to the things that they need to be a part of as a young man or a young woman. Are you unshakable? Are you constantly looking for ways to show them who Jesus is, what he's done in their life, what he has for them? Are you grounded in who God is? Here at Family Church, um, we're starting this kind of new rollout of something that we can do to help families in the everyday routines of life or the everyday whatever is going on in your life to show them who Jesus is. And so we kind of entitle this the family discipleship framework and kind of an easier way to remind, it, remind yourself is the three R's. The first is routines, routines. Like how can I show who uh, my kid, my grandkids are in the routines of life, in the everyday kind of mundane life? When you're going to and from work or to and from school, to and from practices, um, when you're sitting around the table, when, when you're just kind of hanging out, going to the park, like what can I do? Something in my family, what we do is when we go on any kind of travels, even if we go up to Eugene or we go across the country, spend some time with our family, we all, when we're in the van, as soon as we hit the interstate, we go around the car and we, we all pray for our trip. We always pray, especially for me, I pray no tickets, you know, but no tickets. We have a great time as a family to connect and have fun. Another thing that, that we do as a family, when we drop our kids off at school, we just pray for them. We're on our way there anyways. It's a chance just to help them see God in our everyday life. When we're sitting around the dinner table, when we're actually all together, we go through a thing called joy, junk, and Jesus. And we share our joy. Each of us shares the good things that happened for the day, the things that brought us excitement or laughter, and then we talk about the junk, the thing that didn't go out so well. Maybe it was like I had a hard meeting. There's one of my kids had, their friends had a tough day. I mean, just anything that wasn't really what they liked about the day. And then we go to the Jesus part. And the Jesus part is just explaining what did we get to do with Jesus today? How did Jesus show up in our life today? As I was reading, I, I noticed this in scripture. So we get to do this all together. I mean, like even when we're traveling and we see an ambulance that goes by praying for the person inside the ambulance or as they're re are going to a call, praying for the situation. It, it, things are happening around us all the time. Let's look for opportunities to show our kids who Christ and what God has done in our life. We actually see this in Deuteronomy, one of the first five books of the Bible. Uh, Moses says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. In the everyday life, look for ways, look for opportunities to share what God has done. The second R is responses. Responses have more to do with either mostly unplanned or even planned events or planned things that happen that wasn't what you thought was maybe gonna happen. For instance, maybe you lost a job. 
That wasn't a planned event. That wasn't a planned moment, but it's a chance that we can guide and show our kids that God is purposeful and he has something lined up, that God's good, that he keeps his promises, that we can look for ways and point our kids and guide them to Christ in the midst of difficulties. Or maybe you have to move across the country for one reason or another, or somebody's sick in your family, or there's other things that's happening. And so you have a godly response to guide your kids to the Lord. We see the apostle Paul do this with his uh, young friend, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter three. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You see, even in the responses, we can help show our kids who Jesus is, even pull out the Bible and point to what he's done. And the last is road marks. The last R is road marks. Road marks are celebrations, they're milestones, they're holidays, they're events that we do to symbolize his, his goodness or what he's done in our life. Instead of just saying, oh, happy birthday, it's a huge event and making it a massive thing to point our kids, our grandkids to what God has done. And we've seen this, we just went over this in Exodus 13. How, how Moses says year to year, we celebrate these sacrifices. We, we celebrate, excuse me, these feasts, the feasts of uh, the unleavened bread and the Passover. Like we celebrate these things. And for you, look for ways to celebrate these key marker events in your kids, in your grandkids' life to be purposeful, to be dedicated to your kids and to your family. Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope you guys have a great week. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with us for a couple more minutes. I'm gonna go over the transformational moment with you. Uh, this is what it is. It says, what is one way this week that you can connect the gospel through routines, responses, and road marks? I love that. What is a way that you can uh, connect the gospel in your everyday life uh, connect the gospel, maybe in something that happens that was that was unplanned or potentially planned, but something that had happened, or maybe there's a milestone, maybe there's a birthday, maybe there's something that's coming up. What is a way that you can connect the gospel through your rhythms, through your responses, or through your road marks this week? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for you. Thank you that you are a purposeful God. Help us to be purposeful with our family. Help us to show our family, our kids, our grandkids, maybe even our adult children, who you are. Help us to uh, look for ways to share the gospel, to share your goodness. God, I pray that this week can be the beginning of something new and something fresh in our families, that we don't look for the church building to raise our kids spiritually, but that we start to become the spiritual hero for our children and for our grandchildren. So God, be with them. Give them the boldness and, and the encouragement that's needed to do this. We trust all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys later. Hope you have a great week.